<clears throat> okay, everyone. So our presenter today is Dr. James K. Winfield. Dr. Winfield serves as the Associate Dean for the First Year Experience General Education and Retention Strategies at Southern New Hampshire University's Global Campus. He's a proud first-gen graduate with extensive experience in first-year programs, teaching, designing curriculum, and leading faculty development. Dr. Winfield's dissertation and his research interests are focused on the career self-efficacy and academic major decisions of low-income first-generation college students. He enjoys examining pop culture to unpack narratives on first-gen characters and college themes in film and television. He's a fan of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and he enjoys spending time with his family. Dr. Winfield, thank you for being here with us today. All right, Sam, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to this time that we have today uh, just to talk about the first gen brand and what that means. So bear with me for a second as I proceed with uh, the transitional part of this and making certain that my presentation uploads. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that and then we will go ahead and get started. I have a difficult time with silence. How's everybody doing today? <clears throat> We're all okay, okay. Excited to be here. Barely made it, but we made it. We're here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I get that. <laughs> I feel you. Okay, seems like we're ready. Thank you, James. So James, we could see your screen and now we cannot. Is that intentional? Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Pulled up on the wrong spot. So just want to make sure I got that situated. All right. So welcome everyone. So glad that you're here and looking forward to talking about the first gen brand. So often when we hear brand, uh, we don't usually hear about it aligned with being, you know, being first gen. And in this dialogue, I'm, I'm hoping for us to have an enriching conversation about what that looks like, how does it manifest, and then I'm going to lean into a couple of anecdotes and a couple of points that I'm aware of to ensure that we're able to walk through this confidently and to ensure that you know that you have everything that you need in order to make this work. So as Sam introduced me, she talked about a couple of these things, but I, I think it's best to just kind of offer that human lens because I am a person, right? Uh, often we hear, we get in these sessions and then we hear individuals talk about uh, what they do, uh, not necessarily who they are. And that leans into the concept of brand because it's a, it's a lot of storytelling, whether you realize it or not. And I'm gonna walk you through a couple of tools to do that. So uh, my name is James Winfield. I'm also known as Dr. J. Uh, by a lot of my students. Um, they've just, that's just been pegged and coined with me for some time now. And it makes it a little, little more informal as well, but uh, maintains, I guess, the prestige of being, <laughs> you know, in this field as well. So that's been a really cool, funny thing that's kind of developed over the time over my with my students. I'm a native of Birmingham, Alabama. I'm a point of my um, actually upbringing and identity that I take full pride in uh, because as you may know from history lessons, uh, Birmingham, Alabama is one of the main um, arteries of the civil rights movement. Uh, so that has a huge influence of uh, my pride in my race, how I was brought up, and along with uh, the, the struggles and um, triumphs uh, that people have made to ensure that I, among others, have the opportunities that we have today. I'm a proud first-generation college student, as it was spoken of earlier. In addition to that, I've been working in higher education in multiple capacities for about 15 years. And then from that, as mentioned, 
mention I am a family man. I love the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I am a food enthusiast, so I'm an unofficial food critic. Um, I'm a foodie. I, I love uh, just trying, uh, experiencing culture through cuisine. So that's just a part of who I am as well. And um, just wanted to share those little anecdotes because sometimes in introductions, you know, you may not necessarily get that part, but wanted to share that with you all. So the objectives of what we're going to talk about today, a brand definition, what does that mean? Then we're going to talk about your unique brand and how to develop it, and then leveraging uh, that brand uh, to benefit you and continued success. So brand recognition, right? So if you think about brand recognition, there is often, you know, you go in a store, there are certain logos, there are certain uh, things that you see and you're like, I know what that is. You don't even have to like, the name doesn't have to be on it, but there's something iconic about it that stands out and it resonates with you. And just bear with me. I want to play just a quick game uh, with you all regarding brand recognition. So I'm unable to truly like be in the chat, but I, I can pretty much extract what you all are going to probably share regarding some of these. So what I'm going to do is show some logos. And from that, I want you in the chat just to kind of put in there, what do you associate with that logo? It can be a saying, it can be what it is, it can be anything that you associate with it, all right? So we're going to do this uh, with just with a few that I've selected. All right, so I'm linger on that for a couple of seconds. All right, uh, EA Sports. If you have played any kind of sports games, I mean, they have, EA Sports has a, a, a brand that extends decades. Um, I'm talking back to when I was a child and playing Sega Genesis games. I'm not going to say when that was. But with that, uh, when you would put the game in the console, even now and in a PS5 or whatever you may uh, choose to play, EA Sports is in the game. They have a recognition that spans because they have capitalized on everything from Madden to WWE games, right? So we recognize that. And you see that and you know that they are the company that produces the best and the most athletics games, all right? Next one, it's a very iconic image. Pretty sure that a lot of people will have something to say about this one. Okay, all right. This is the infamous silhouette of Michael Jordan. A number 23 of the Bulls uh, came back with the 45, but he is known uh, for his shoes changed the game, uh, literally. And with that, this image itself says flight. It says air. It says jump man, right? So we associate that with this particular brand. And this one. A couple of seconds on that. Another silhouette. All right. Coca-Cola is what this is. The bottle speaks for itself. The bottle is actually trademarked, so no one else can actually use it from my research. Um, I'm from the South and uh, would actually frequent and go on to the uh, Coca-Cola factory and, and seeing how they do the production and everything. So it's very unique. But with that, uh, Coca-Cola's brand is gone for some time now. And with that, their mantra is typically enjoy, right? Just enjoy. And they want you to enjoy this beverage. And over the years, they kind of add things to it. But the bottle itself, the, I'm sure the moment you saw it, like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what that is. And this one, I think you all might know this one. I think some of you might know this one. All right. So I'm sure <laughs> uh, in the chat, uh, I'm seeing Go Blue, Go Wolverines uh, associated uh, with the University of Michigan. Congrats on the championship. Um, it has this image is aligned with your institution and it has a brand, right? That's something you connect to. 
right? Uh, you can think about the educational experience. You can think about the athletic ex experience. All of that is associated with a, a logo, a brand that extracts that from you. And you're able to say, you know what? I, I recognize that or I have a memory associated with it. So that same feeling is what I want to help empower you all to have when individuals see your name, your likeness, all these other components to ensure that your brand stands out. So in the chat, I just want to know, like, what is brand? What do you what is brand in the context of what we're probably going to talk about today? What do you feel is brand? You and feel free to unmute try. Oh, sorry, James. I was just going to offer that folks could also unmute themselves for a moment and yeah, blurt it out. Okay, and I see someone. Oh, can you see the chat? Yeah, I, I pulled it up on my other screen. I see how you represent your identity and background. That's good. What you stand for. Something you leverage to make money or gain recognition. How people recognize you and what you're good at. I like that. Any other? All values. Okay. Okay, keep them coming. Okay, well, that's a good start. That's a really good start. And what I want to do is actually go into a couple of components of what that might mean or what it can mean for you. So there's a great article by Kara Dennison uh, that came out last year that unpacks personal branding and how it's important to build yours. So what I want to do is talk about a couple of points from that. And Dennison talks about brand from really merging the personal and professional. Sometimes you hear it as disaggregating. You'll hear, okay, you need your personal brand, you need your professional brand. But as the professional uh, landscape has shifted, in many ways, they're one and the same, right? Because many people realize that it's hard to have a professional brand and not put yourself in that because your work is you, right? <laughs> or part of you. So how do you disaggregate that? So in that definition along, what stands out the most that I want you to take away from that? And feel free to look that up. It's a pretty accessible piece. Um, it's Kara Dennison. Um, your brand is your story. It's your position within your industry. And it's your values and beliefs. And what was great about what you all put in the chat, in many ways, you put every single component of that, worded slightly differently or directly or indirectly. And that is what this is about. So when I think about brand, I think about certain key figures, certain people in the media. Um, you think about TikTok influencers, you think about YouTube influencers when we commonly think about brand. But I want to like pivot that a little bit because you know many of us are not influencers yet, but we can be influencers in our space of what we do and how to take that same mindset and pull it into the work that you do. I think about Jay-Z. Uh, Jay-Z is an acclaimed rapper who has had a career that has spanned decades. But also, also he's a great entrepreneur, uh, considering his brands uh, with uh, various beverages. Um, he has brands with, of course, he did a stint with uh, clothing lines, and then also um, his partnership with the NFL, particularly with the halftime shows, he has some say within that piece and garnered that relationship over the past couple of years. But he said that my brands are an extension of me. They're close to me. So that lends into that definition that I was speaking to earlier, where it's hard to disaggregate the two, right? So they build upon each other and they inform one another. Dan Schaubel, who is an author and workplace expert, um, I follow him on LinkedIn and a lot of his work that he puts out. He has a lot of great things to say as far as really keeping a pulse of, of workplace and what careers and trajectories are, are moving along out there. But he says your personal brand serves as your best protection against business factors you can't control. So what that means is that at the end of the day, if you are with a company or an organization, and it may not necessarily be as stable in a certain time, but you have your brand and your work and others see it, therefore it can offer and leverage more opportunity for you.
Okay, so keep that in mind as you move forward. Like, how do you make yourself stand out? I'm not saying that you need to like do all this extra stuff, but there are certain things that I think you can do. You can focus uh, and, and really lean on, lean into that to ensure that you make the best of your work and that it benefits you and moving forward. But there's another layer of this uh, that has come out when you think about brand and really it aligns with identity, right? Um, Yasso, uh, Dr. Terry Yasso, uh, she comes from a sociology background, but a lot of her work has been really pulled into the work that I do within higher education and empowering students and leveraging something known as social capital. And um, we all have various levels of social capital. It's just a matter of how we choose to use it. And with that, Yasso says she affirms that identity and its many intersections support and can enrich social capital, right? So your identity, your identity informs that, right? So what is a part of you that stands out to you, that means something to you, it doesn't necessarily have to be as unique as you think it needs to be, but what means something to you? And then we're going to think about how does that inform your work? And then with that identity, uh, Dr. Beverly Tatum, uh, who wrote a, a phenomenal book some years ago, and I'm a real big fan of that text as more as it goes into the newer version, Why All the Black Kids Sitting in the Back of the Cafeteria, uh, this text outlines the progression of race and identity. And she talks about that from her personal experiences, along with what has taken place in society. But anyway, with that, she talks about identity and the complexities of it. And she talks about how it's shaped by your characteristics, familial dynamics, historical factors, and social and political context, ultimately asking the simple yet grand question, who am I? Who am I? So think about who am I, or who are you, rather, and how that informs your brand, right? So we, we've talked about the capital, the identity, and I really want you to think about that self-work. Sometimes I know we don't really get into that as much because we're thinking about, okay, the task of what we need to do, but let's align them and think about uh, how do they fuse together. But there are some key questions that Dr. Tatum asked, and I'm going to just spout them off, and you don't need to respond to them, but I want you to just kind of sit with them. What messages, what messages reflected back to me in the faces of, and voices of my teachers, my neighborhood store clerks? What do I learn from the media about myself? How am I represented in the cultural images around me? Or am I missing from the picture altogether? Those questions can help to inform and get you to think critically about the, the who am I component and how you maneuver through society, what parts are missing in society, and then thinking about how do you fill the gaps. So one thing that I want you all to think about is leveraging your voice. That's a great start to it. And for me, as I start to talk about my process, when I worked at the University of South Carolina, um, I served as the co-chair for our, it was called the Family Fund, but it was with our Advancement and Fundraising Office. And my job, along with the Dean of the School of Information um, and Communication, was that we were charged with this goal to inspire people to raise money to a certain amount of money uh, among staff and faculty uh, to you know, contribute to this fund that we have to support efforts of the institution. And with that, I was asked, I was like, oh, they were asking me, okay, what, what do you wanna say in the publication that's gonna come out in the literature that's gonna go out to uh, all of your colleagues across the campus? And I initially wrote something and then immediately rescinded it because it was very general. It was very basic. And I was like, wait a minute, I need to incorporate what I'm passionate about. And then I thought about, it. I was like, I often give money to our first generation college student efforts because that's what I identify as. So I was like, let me talk about that. So what I did is I chose to leverage my social media and 
do that. And I reached, you know, rescinded my quote and submitted another one. And this is what came out. And I had people to stop me on campus and say, thank you, James, for really for talking about that. Um, I'm first gen. Um, I, I didn't know that we had these efforts on campus and I want to support that. And then also in that same time, we had a huge campaign to increase the level of support for first gen students. So I remember just making this, this tweet. Um, I know it's called X now, so it's more of a post, but um, I made this tweet and then like the provost, all these other people started going on to it and, and reposting it. And granted, the frequency is just 52 and five, you know, retweets, but it was who retweeted it, right, <laughs> that really helped to elevate that. So I uh, wanted to share that as a way to positive, positively leverage your passions. And this was essentially some of the beginnings of me building a brand as well. With that, I also write. Um, with that, I, I use my voice to change the narrative. At my institution, I realized that there was not really any you know, space or uh, pieces that really talked about how faculty can support first generation college students. And I was like, okay, let me write about it. <laughs> so that was something that I was proficient in. That's something that I knew, something I was passionate about. Therefore, let me write about it. So at Southern New Hampshire University, I wrote this piece. Um, and of course you see the picture of a proud first gen alum of the institution. And in that piece, I talked about, you know, in your discussions, in your introductions, talking about being first gen, using the official icon that we have that shows that you're first gen. And also with first gen celebration day that talk, that comes up in November, how do you lean into that conversation as well? So leveraging what's existing or what's not existing and just starting the conversation because I love like within my courses, I'm teaching another um, course this term on um, kind of cultural awareness. And with that, I start off by saying, hey, I'm Dr. J and I tell them where I'm from. I tell them what I do, how long I've been in the field, but I also tell them, hey, I'm a proud first gen student like many of you. And with that, you won't believe how many students will reply with, oh, wow, like, thank you for saying that. Um, I'm glad to see that there's somebody that can understand the challenges. Granted, they might not necessarily, you know, ask me about it all the time, but in the initial introduction, we talk about your identity and how that informs your communication. And they lean into that and how their worldview plays into how they navigate spaces. With this, it's a huge thing to strike balance and it's, it, can be very, it can be very challenging. And this balance is confidence, and competence, right? We live in a society where um, we see a lot of individuals who are very vocal and have big voices, big presences, and that's, that's good, but you should have the presence, but also the knowledge as well. And I empower you all, but all, you know, whether, you know, whatever discipline that you're, you're in, focus in on a part of it, right? And become so well-versed where it's like, okay, yeah, they know that. <laughs> uh, just continue to immerse yourself in it. It could be a certain avenue of it, right? Um, I think about one of my um, peers in undergrad who was in engineering, but was very intrigued by electromagnetics. And that is what has become the pillar in his career is electromagnetics. So just thinking about a part or an interest that really stands out to you within your field. And sometimes it may be a lane that you can carve or say, oh, it's, it's, this is absent. So how do I seek to, to make this more well-known? But anyway, with the confidence, knowing you know, that you can, uh, you might hear a term of self-efficacy arise a lot from the sociological sphere and from the um, psychology sphere. And with that, that's just your one's capacity to know that they can do something within a certain area. And then that intrinsic motivation, making sure that you tap into that. But sometimes we know we get tired and, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, find individuals that can support you. You know, is there someone that you can communicate with? Is there a peer, uh, someone that has been in the field for some time that you communicate with to help 
build you up and affirm you. And that's a huge part of that self-efficacy piece. And that competence is knowing the content, as I mentioned. And then also, I've, I'm really confident in, in this part, uh, incompetence, seeking resources. When you don't know, look it up right? Seek a uh, support, a resource that can actually help you to understand a uh, concept, a factor a little bit better. Um, for me, I think about some of my colleagues when there's something that I'm unsure about uh, regarding, you know, first-gen student support, which I'm well-versed in, but there's still so many layers to it. I'll reach out to a, one of my colleagues, uh, Maria, that works at you know, University of Boston. So just making so sure that I'm able to have that network and that will grow over time. So don't feel like, oh gosh, I need to do all this stuff right now. Uh, continue to build. And as the years go, you will see that not in an actual old school Rolodex, but you will have an actual, you'll have in your phone or in your email, you'll have names of individuals that you can call on uh, regarding certain aspects of your discipline uh, that can help to support you and help to enrich your knowledge base of what you're seeking to share. But I'll say this, as a first-generation college student, for me, uh, there were certain components and, and nuances of a lot of this that I had, I didn't understand. Um, I, I'm, I was Pell eligible. I grew up in the west side of Birmingham. Um, I was the first one in my family to go to college, to navigate the FAFSA, to do all these, these things that were essentially disparate from what uh, my family uh, went through. But I didn't know many people with salary jobs. That was a, a, a concept that no one really talked about. They, they only knew about hourly wages. And uh, I bring that up to show the disconnect that I felt when I was in my job search process, right? Uh, there was definitely an old school mindset of how to go forth and, and get a job, right? Oh yeah, you just need to get your resume and just like go to these places. That's not how it works anymore. <laughs> uh, was what I was telling my my, my great uncle. Uh, I was like, it's a little bit different. It's more automated, right? You have to submit it through this pipeline online and then it gets these algorithms that, you know, based upon key terms, they see if you're qualified and then you get to the next point and then the next point after that. So understanding the process. Uh, so as I mentioned previously, finding individuals that can support and, and provide context on that, it's very helpful. So you won't feel lost. Um, of course, I know you have career services on your campus, but um, if you can connect with anyone that works in the field, that can really help you out as well. Um, I was told to keep your nose down and do your job. That was something that I was told by my parents and, and, and other individuals, which was not bad advice. But as I began to work, I realized, what about everything else, right? I can keep my nose down and do my job in a cubicle and then continually get overlooked for promotions and other um, areas to, to excel my career. So that's when I realized that there was a huge emphasis on professional development. So I had to make certain that I went to these conferences that I presented. Um, sometimes I will say I am, I had to pull back a little bit. I was into that space excessively at one point. Okay, I need to put my name on there. But then I realized I needed to just kind of chill and take it easy <laughs> and balance that perspective of uh, being more intentional, right? Uh, which presentations were going to hold the most weight. So I have colleagues that I co-present with versus trying to do them on my own. Um, and we can be more of a force uh, to share insights and best practices, right? So anyway, just wanted to share that. Uh, nothing wrong with keeping your nose down and doing your job, but there's also other layers that you need to consider uh, with that if you want to be seen and be able to have that influence to expand upon your brand. And side hustles were common. Um, I knew individuals who had jobs, not careers coming up. Uh, there's a complete difference. And what I was seeking to do was have a career, uh, which was not something that I truly saw around me. And so going into that uh, trajectory was something that I had to unpack and kind of sit with as well. Um, and 
do, I guess, essentially side hustles that connected to my field. Of course, there are times where it's like, okay, it was low on money and I needed to like, okay, do something else to just kind of get through a season. But ultimately, my goal is to be an academic administrator. And with that, okay, I teach to align with that to get my student uh, facing insights and um, and interaction. So really thinking about how does this all marry together, right? So my story and process. I just want to share with you, this is not everything, <laughs> but I tried to extract a couple of, of points where I began, began to know that who am I, right? Uh, that I was bringing up earlier that Dr. Tatum charges us with. And I remember in my conversation with Sam, we were unpacking ideas, you know, for this session. And we talked about the personalization. And I, and I want to lean into what, what I did, not just to say, hey, this is what I did, but to show you those key points. So well before this even started, I was told that I was first gen by an advisor. Um, an advisor of my orientation program. I served as an orientation leader and um, I, I was promoted to the lead orientation team and it was four of us. I was the only person of color and I was uh, one of two uh, first gen uh, students who served on that. And the other guy, I didn't even know he was first gen until after we graduated. We were like, man, that was a missed opportunity for us to connect. Um, but with that, we still keep in touch, and that's something that we're able to hold on to now. But anyway, I started out my career in higher education in 2010, and once I got my master's in higher education administration. And then from there in 2012, um, I pivoted. Um, I was still in higher education, but I began to work for TRIO programs. Um, I was very in inspired by uh, the mission of TRIO programs. For those of you who don't know, TRIO is a federally funded pro set of programs that supports first-gen college students. And I worked at the University of South Carolina with her Upward Bound program, helping high school students gain access into college to become first-gen college students. This was rewarding work for me, and it really filled my bucket uh, to help me to see that there were students that wanted this insight, wanted this support, and just needed that nudge. And to know that like 98% of my students went on to higher education was great. And the remaining 2% went straight into the military. So they all had a pathway uh, to success, right? And then in 2014, uh, the National Resource Center for the First Year Experience uh, decided to have a first gen institute that they were hosting nationally. And they were looking for Institute faculty members. And uh, based upon a referral, based upon the work I was doing with TRIO and uh, the state organization, I was referred to be a faculty facilitator. And I have been active with that since 2014. And with that, I chose that as an opportunity to lean more into the literature. And I was surrounded by all these great people who were also faculty on this institute. And we became uh, good colleagues and friends. And unintentionally, we just kept up with each other and kept each other abreast of what's taking place in the field. Then uh, from there, um, I led presentations and helped institutions and helped my institution earn a first-gen designation through the Center for First-Gen Student Success. Uh, that was more of a process. I, I led those presentations for years. Then from there, I was accepted into my doctoral program in 2018, and immediately I knew what I was going to write on. <laughs> uh, I knew I was going to write on something orienting around first-gen uh, student success. Now, I will say for like, you know, many of us that are going through the thesis and uh, dissertating process, we know that, that that process can be arduous, right? You, you're going through it and you're trying to figure out how to focus that topic. And I had a great advisor uh, that helped me to figure out specifically what to unpack there. And it became what Sam mentioned in my introduction, the career self-efficacy of first-gen college students. And then from there in 2020, um, I continue to support the Center for First Gen Student Success, uh, doing you know, pre-con, uh, pre-conference workshops with them, and um, also just serving on their advocacy group, 
uh, speaker program, those types of components, and just making certain that I'm in the loop of that, and also writing publications as well for that, to put the word out there on what First Gen is and how it's evolving and growing, and why it is, you know, growing to be 50 some odd percent of students identify as First Gen versus the 33 uh, percent that it was previously. And then from there, um, in 2022, I was like, I'm going to get the most out of my research as possible. <laughs> so I made certain to publish that into a, a research article. It was my first soul journal uh, research um, article. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie to you. I was a bit intimidated by the process early on, even though I completed a dissertation, I had to have someone in my corner uh, to say to me, James, go ahead and submit that manuscript because I had this kind of imposter syndrome, which I'll talk about a little bit later. I was like, I don't know if it's going to get accepted. Like I had the manuscript sitting there. The article was essentially done because it's, an, it's, it's extracted from my dissertation. I had to, of course, modify and rewrite uh, parts of it. But having someone in my corner to nudge me and say, just go ahead and do it. Don't overthink it. Just know that sometimes we do overthink it. And that person that motivated me to do that was one of my fellow faculty facilitators from that First Gen Institute. And she sent me the link to submit the article <laughs> in the first place and just pushed me to do that. And of course, it got accepted. Um, do all of our manuscripts get, get accepted? No. Um, but that was just one that happened to work uh, for, for me. And I'm proud that I, I went ahead and took that step because... I had some goals that I wanted to achieve with that work. And one of them was to turn it into an article because I'm like, hey, I spent the past, what, four years working on this thing. We're going to make this thing stretch. <laughs> We're going to get as much as we can out of this. But with all of that, um, I went from first-gen graduate to first-gen advocate. Uh, the first picture you see is me. Um, I'm a lot slimmer on that picture. In, in 2008, <laughs> and I'm on the campus of Auburn University, and at the time, I was a campus tour guide, <clears throat> which gave me access to one of the highest buildings on campus, and I was like, this will be an optimal opportunity to have this picture, and I, I look at this picture, and it's um, it's rewarding to know that I was able to, to do that, so um, my wife took photos, and um, I'm looking at our um, administration building, which is Sanford Hall. And I was actually a student assistant there uh, to 2024 um, today, which I was able to do a TEDx talk and talk about first gen and talk about uh, my experience and my journey and to really reflect on that and to make it come full circle was reward. It's been rewarding and knowing that my path is not done. I'm still working to become better. There's still more that I can do. But ultimately, when it comes to elements of first gen and the first year experience, individuals uh, seek me out uh, to you know, help them to understand. And then I'm in a network of individuals that can help to support me with that as well. But how do you get there? Right. You know, I talked about those connections and how do you foster those? Sometimes that is one of the most challenging components. How do I connect with people? And there's this concept known as weak ties. Weak ties is coined by Meg J, Dr. Meg J. Um, she wrote The Defining Decade, which essentially talks about, you know, how your, your 20s is, is a pivotal point. Um, but I will say that taking the fo focus off of just the 20s and just taking those practices and implementing them wherever you are in your life is really important. But those seemingly least connections, alumni, you can be an alumni of the same school, uh, you know, being from the same city or state or knowing some of the same people. Uh, those are just clear examples that I can think of, right? Think about times where you've been in a conversation and the conversation started to spiral a bit in, in a good way to where you were able to find a connection with the person. Right. It can be based upon a food interest. It can be based upon going, having gone to the same restaurant. It could be, um, you know, communing over liking a, a television show. So that is a skill that I would say that continue to work on that, you know, asking those questions 
and then finding that common ground organically. And then from there, you're able to build your network. And sometimes that happens with, I would say, knowing the same people when you find those spaces that work for you. So this is a quote from Dr. Meg Jay um, about those weak ties. So information and opportunities spread farther and faster through weak ties than through close friends, because weak ties have fewer overlap overlapping contacts. Weak ties are like bridges. You cannot see all the way, all the way across, so there is no telling where they might lead. So there are possibilities in those uh, light touches and connections there. Guided reflection um, on presence. Um, these are just some thoughts on, on, on presence and reflection. And what I want to do, I don't want to like take too much time into that. I'm just going to you know, put on a couple of them and then Sam, I'll just send them to you uh, so that individuals can have those uh, to process on. But thinking about what does presence mean to you and think about how you fill a space and what do you, what do you do in those spaces? And what spaces do you feel most confident? And then thinking about those that make you feel empowered, those moments and those people. So the power of presence ultimately culminates into this, your persona, it can be your attire, not always that, but it can be your attire and it can be how you network. So the landscape has changed um, in many ways. Um, I have a good friend um, who does their presentations and they wear some of the nicest um, Air One Jordans um, when, they, when they present. <laughs> and that's just a part of their... That's just them, right? And but it doesn't take away from their professional brand. And this is just a silly picture of me at a uh, commencement recently, where you know I was like, I want to be on brand, but I also want to be comfortable. Um, in that, you know, we start many of us, uh, many other deans, we we wear we wear tennis shoes. And I was like, let me find some Vans um, because I just felt like they, those fit uh, my outfit. And then found some that were on brand, on color, got lots of compliments on them and rocked those while I was there. Um, in many ways, I guess I'm kind of, and then with socks, I love socks. So some of my students informally, in addition to being Dr. J, know me as a sock doc. So got that as well. But um, I, I use social media as well uh, to really put my brand out there and to share a lot of things uh, that, that I tend to do. Um, find a space that works for you. I'm not saying you need to use these or these at all, but I, I strive to be an approachable academic. I don't want to be that person that is, uh, that want, it's the balance of respect, but approachability. And then of course, like I said, I like shoes. Find a hub. Thought groups, collectives, professional associations, national centers, uh, those are ways to kind of find your group. And my affiliations and why I have them. So the National Resource Center for the First Year Experience, I was connected with them when I worked at the University of South Carolina. That was a space that actually started that first gen institute. Um, I serve on their national advisory board now, and that's well over 10 years later, just being committed to them, going to their conferences for the past decade and supporting their work. And they saw it as, as a benefit. NASPA. Um, I didn't know much about professional associations um, within the field of, of student affairs, uh, but my vice president for student affairs funded me to go to my first conference. And then from there, I was like, you, know, like you, you should stay connected as much as you can, um, even in small ways, review a program here and there, or do like a small committee. Not, you don't have to do anything major. And I've been committed with them ever since and have been able to be active in my region. And then the Center for First Gen Student Success. Um, as I mentioned, since this um, center was started, um, I was uh, seeking to be engaged with it. And then from other connections, I was able to be on their center advocacy group. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that you all will be like in this level, you know, different levels of leadership within these organizations. Find something that works for you. But here you have two centers and a professional association. And from that, those are, have been my professional hubs to help me foster and extend my brand. But know that you're not an imposter. Uh, too often we tend to psych ourselves out, right? And then I want you all to know that you are worthy and qualified. So ultimately lessons learned, your work is a brand extension. 
align your passions and interests. Assess where you are and think about where you want to be. One of my dear friends and colleagues who is a first gen scholar and entrepreneur, um, Dr. Eve uh, Hudson Blakeney, um, has this quote that she made during one of my sessions uh, that I hosted. And it was, she said, to go forth confidently into a space that no one around you has been. And this was in relation to being a first gen student, then becoming a first gen professional. You're in a space and you're like, how did I get here? <laughs> what do I do now that I am here? And how do I move forward? Leveraging just some of those things that I talked about. Some of those are unique to my path. And I think some of those are, are very transferable as well. But making certain that you just think about, yeah, there's uncertainty with it, but you've got it. And if you don't have it now, guess what? You'll learn it. Just make certain that you ask. Find trusted allies, find people that can support you. And there are so many ways that you can remain connected and excel because I know that the world is in front of all of you. And then of course, in being an academic in proper APA fashion, I have my references here. So with that being said, uh, that concludes the formal part of the presentation. And I am more than welcome for any questions um, and conversation at this time. Thank you, James. Um, so y'all, as we transition to the Q&A, I'd like to give you a second to gather your thoughts and your questions. Um, my colleague is going to place our evaluation survey in the chat. And if you could just do me a favor and open the link now so that you'll have a tab ready and waiting for you when you're done. Thank you for doing that. Okay, so now I ask you again to please change your name so that we know that who was here. <laughs> and um, if you have any, what questions do you have for Dr. Winfield? Um, you can type them in the chat, you can raise your hand. I know we have one question in the chat already, James. Um, someone asks that, or says, I tend to network with fellow first gens easier than with those that are not first gen. How do we connect our first gen brand to those that are not first gen? Yeah, um, with the first gen brand, I'll say this, you will be surprised at the allies and advocates that reside that are not first gen. Um, I think about, there's a, a collective group that I co-chair known as the Black First Gen Collective. And everyone on that group is not first gen. Most of them are, but there are individuals who are not. Um, they're just as passionate about the work because they're passionate about access. Uh, they're passionate about affordability. Uh, they're passionate about the underdogs getting their fair share. And for some, I've heard individuals say, hey, you know, my parents were first gen. And I saw what they had to go through because they finished their degrees when I was a kid and I saw them up. You know, just you never know how many people will connect to the story. So never, don't stray away from allyship that resides outside of first gen because I think it's it's like with any kind of allyship, we need all all or most, you know, more individuals on board to understand the narratives uh, because we don't want it to, to just reside among us. We want it to be among us, but we also want to share it out as well. Yeah. James, is there a time when you can imagine folks not feeling safe to share? And how do they navigate that? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, there are there are individuals, I feel like, um, who have, I would say, be, be weary of the individuals who have the deficit mindsets, okay? And with that, seek to try to adjust that narrative, if possible, um, through information. You may not be able to change it immediately. I get that, you know, uh, but making certain that individuals don't say, oh, it's the poor first gen kids, you know, oh, it's the poor black kids, you know, that kind of mindset, I don't um, favor that at all, oh, it's the poor kids, you know, that kind of stuff. So uh, seek to elevate the positives that come out of that. And that actually hits me pretty closely right now, because 
Um, I recently came, I'm, I'm that's on a trip right now where I've been able to go home. I'm originally from Alabama, as mentioned. And the neighborhood that I grew up in uh, has a really bad reputation, unfortunately. And everyone from my neighborhood are not bad people. There was like a couple of people, of course, like small group that you think of, and they were just the most vocal uh, that got into, you know, I guess, issues where the media would would um would, would kind of latch on to that. Um, but you know, I caught up with a classmate who owns a restaurant in my old neighborhood, and he's just been so successful and seeing him, him turn his food truck into like an actual restaurant and storefront. And then I have another friend that works in DC doing some lobbying work, you know, it just changing that narrative, you know, I would say just seek to change that narrative where you can and also have a, a pulse on people, have a pulse on people and those that you feel, you know, confident, you know, trusting to share that, you know, trust your gut you know, with that. And then otherwise, you know, just kind of pace it out. You know, I think we all can identify with those situations. Thank you, James. So someone asks, how do we change our brand, particularly when it's been part of our identity for so long? They've personally been known as a poker player for almost two decades. Most everything they did was associated with poker. That's how people knew them. And how do we change our brand when that poker space is no longer serving us. That side okay. hustle we speak of. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, with that, I mean, it's still a part of hi your history. And I think that that makes it even cooler and richer, right? To show where we've come from and what we've done, right? Oddly enough, I will say one of my faculty advisors was a chef a great chef. <laughs> and I had no clue until, you know, I'm watching, you know, one of the popular shows. Um, I can't remember. It was Master Chef. It was one of those shows. And he was on it. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, wait a minute. And the way that he brought it up was just like, hey, in the past life, I used to cook and I appreciate food. So, but that's a part of his history, right? So I would say you don't necessarily have to stray away from it. But just think of it, you remember I talked about those brand extensions? You're great at poker, right? <laughs> so I would say that that's a part of it. That's just this my philosophy on it. No, cool. I appreciate that. Thank you. No problem. James, is there a way to incorporate your brand in professional spaces slash presentations, such as conferences, defenses, and other similar spaces? It kind of oh, seems yeah. like an art that few people see seamlessly can do and they would love to be able to do it themselves yeah yeah um sometimes you know you have to gauge the space and figure out okay what nuances or elements i can incorporate in there but i'll say this something that i did as i mentioned i'm a marvel fan i grew up loving superheroes and with that my dissertation defense i was like you know what i put all this work into this I'm going to throw like some Easter eggs of superhero stuff in it in my presentation. So all of my, um, the individuals I interviewed, the four that I focused on, I gave them pseudonyms of superheroes. And in my presentation, I had them depicted as such, uh, mirroring that of individuals that were within a, a certain hero universe. So with that, you know, uh, I was just able to do that. And I was actually empowered to do so from a colleague who told me, James, you know what? You have a really good way of writing about leadership. You should probably write a leadership piece on the different elements of these, of like the Avengers or something. And I still haven't written the piece completely yet, but I got the green light <laughs> from a, a well-known researcher and practitioner. And he's like, no, like, lean into that you know that's that's a part of your your quirks and your nuances so yeah I just put that in there and I was like okay well I'm going to seek this space and dissertating and my defense and I did that and I knew it'd be welcomed by the audience that I had as well um, and I, it didn't take away from uh, the analysis and the rigor so just try to weave it in where you can right 
and then seek feedback from peers if you feel like, okay, this might be off base. I like that um, suggestion of sort of experimenting with it, just mm -hmm. sort of weaving your heart into, or what fills your soul into your daily life <laughs> and uh, particularly professional spaces of your daily life and yeah. see what lands, see what doesn't and adjust. We're all scientists here, right? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, Someone asks, James, you talk about using social media to promote your personal brand. It's kind of a fusion of public-private identities and our presentation of self on social media. I guess I'm curious about how you balance those when posting to social media, since every post would potentially reflect on your brand. Do you see most posts as brand-related? Yeah, I guess when it gets to a certain point, you can't negate the fact that it is associated with, you know, with brand. Um, I think about people have different ways of how they categorize it. You know, some people have certain buckets, right? Okay, well, Facebook is my personal, you know, and they have their names categorized differently. Uh, some people seek to shift the dynamic of what they present completely um, on all vessels uh, to ensure that there's um, alignment. Uh, for me, I don't really have anything to hide, per se. Of course, there are things within my, my life that I, I keep personal. I just don't put it out there, <laughs> right? Um, but there are components where uh, I like have like shifted and a little bit have seen like, okay, this is what people gravitate toward, right? So in the introduction that Sam provided, uh, she talked about my uh, alignment with putting out pop culture narratives. I have this random interest <laughs> of watching movies, TV, cartoons, and if there is a college theme narrative or a first gen narrative, I got my little notebook and I'm writing stuff. Like my wife even knows she's like, if she sees me with my little notepad, she's like, you're, you're about to write something. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Um, so I mean, everything from Abbott Elementary uh, to, uh, you know, to Spider-Man being a first gen student, I've written, you know, about that. So I real I wrote a piece randomly. And the reason that I wrote it and put it out on LinkedIn was because nobody would pick it up. I wrote a piece on um, a show that I like to watch Power, and there were some first gen narratives there. No one picked up the piece. And I was like, I curate it myself. I put it on my LinkedIn profile, and then they started to get some likes and hits. And then I was like, OK, this will just kind of be my space to put this out. So at least once a month, I do first gen Fridays. And I put out a piece about a show, movie. It could be new or old. Uh, and I'll just write a piece and share it out there. Uh, regarding a first gen or college narrative. So just kind of tested the waters with that and it doesn't deviate from my brand. So I think it's, what I'm saying is that everyone has to have their own pulse check on what's appropriate and what's not because sometimes there are boundaries you want to set and that's perfectly fine. Do that. Thank you, James. Y'all have one last question and that relates sort of, James, to what you just mentioned. Can you want to have a brand without putting their writing out there? Oh, most definitely. There are so many, you know, vehicles and vessels to get information out there. It doesn't necessarily have to be centric around writing. Um, it can be around, like, narratives can be verbal, right? I think about individuals that I follow, like, via TikTok, where they have, they just put their narratives over to recap an event or videos, you know, those types of components. So whichever way you choose to do it is how you decide to do it. It's more of what's organic to you and what people will kind of, you know, gravitate towards. For me, I've just, got, I've had a writing bug since I have, you know, engaged in the dissertating process. And it was also more of a task for me because I have a little bit of a, I had a, a, a professor, some years ago, they kind of questioned my writing. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to do my due diligence and become a, as great of a writer as I can be. And I and, uh, encountered a supervisor who supported me in that I was like, the best way to learn how to write is to keep doing it. And I just leaned into it. Okay, thank you, James. Thank you. And 
I want to thank everyone in the audience here today for your presence and your participation. And thank you, Dr. Winfield, for sharing both your time and your wisdom with us today. The recording of this event will be processed over a few weeks, and then it will be sent out to y'all. And remember, when you have the opportunity, please uh, take a short break and pop over to the evaluation survey so that we can keep improving our programming for you. Okay, thank you. Take care of yourself.